talking about marriage, communication. This is the second part. I'm not sure how many parts on communication we have. I could probably do every part from now on on communication. We would not fully exhaust that. And um, last time we talked about the five love languages. Has anybody, please lie if you need to, but has anybody um, taken some of that and gone home and tried it? That's what I thought. Okay, good. <laughs> Y'all are not very good liars. This is where you made me feel like a better pastor. Anyway, I'm, I'm kidding, okay? Um, so, five love languages. If you have not read the book, read the book and then actually do it. Here's an example at my house. Uh, Mother's Day, right? Mother's Day was just last Sunday. Missy's love languages is not gifts. It's not, uh, it's not uh, acts of... Is it that? No, it's not that. It's, it's quality time and it's uh, words of affirmation. So what I made the kids do this year was every kid and daddy, not a kid, we, we all wrote letters, words of affirmation, affirming her. And so we all wrote, hand wrote letters and gave them to her. And then for quality time, her and I are in the garage together building her keepsake box to put all that stuff in over the years and that kind of stuff. So, and so my point is, is normally the easy thing for me to do was run to TJ Maxx and buy her something that said, you know, home is where the heart is, right? And just, and you just stick it on the wall. That's easy to do. Make sense? But that doesn't really mean much to her. She's going to smile and make me think it is, but it really doesn't mean much to her. That makes sense? And so I chose gifts for Mother's Day based upon her love languages. So this actually can help you if you will put it into practice, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. One lone LSU fan makes me feel better. That is the one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about communication. Communication, uh, we're going to start with this quote from Bill Winston, words. Y'all ready? By the way, Matt, if you have the scriptures ready, we're going to be in, first of all, Proverbs 10. Don't put it up there. 19. Proverbs 10, 19. Don't put it up there. I'm ready for it. Words are meant more for creation rather than communication. Words are meant more for creation rather than communication. We call this communication, and fundamentally it's true. Missy, I'm out of deodorant. Next time you're at Walmart, will you please pick me up some more deodorant? Is that communication? Yes, I have communicated a thought or an idea. Is that the type of communication that makes healthy marriage? No, that, that's communication necessary to living right? When you go to the restaurant and your waiter comes to you and says, uh, what would you like to drink? I would like half sweet tea, half unsweet tea. You have communicated, but you're not necessarily in deep relationship. When we talk about communication inside of the context of marriage, we're not talking about the fundamental caveman communication of me need more water, Right? We're talking about the depths of expressing the heart of each other and the, and, 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 the, and the relationship. In other words, the words spoken in healthy communication in a relationship are creating an atmosphere. They're creating an environment. They're creating a relationship. What is generally the first thing you do when you start dating somebody? You do this all the time via many methods. Is talk, talk talk, talk, talk. Your relationship was founded on communication, not uh, not like I need more sweet tea. Your relationship was, well, what do you like? Well, what do you do? Or what's your hobby? Or what's this? And you talk and you talk and man, this relationship grows and grows and grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And, grows. and then somewhere down the, the line, communication begins to dwindle. And it's not just the discovery of one another, but this, it's communication that is creating an atmosphere of the relationship. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Words, even biblically and fundamentally, were always used to create. In the beginning, God said, let there be light, and boom, there's creation. So whenever we're speaking to one another in the context of marriage, we are creating an environment. How many of you have experienced good environment created through healthy communication? How many of you have experienced bad environment through poor communication? Okay. 
You know, if, if, if I come in and I see Missy and I'm, and I'm like, how was your day? And that's so awesome to hear about that. And that is great. And I'm so proud of you. And she, we are creating this glorious, happy moment. If I come in and I'm like, how come you didn't wash my shirt, my favorite shirt? I need my favorite shirt. And I'm yelling, I'm screaming. Then I'm creating an environment with my words. It's one that I'm going to punch you upside your head, right? Amen? And so our words, if we understand that our communication is not just getting points across, it's not just the fundament, fundamental, uh, I need this, you need that, uh, more chips, less salsa. It, it, it literally, we're creating the environment of our marriage. Amen? And so this is the power, the desire, and the danger of communication. The power of communication, it, it creates life. What does James teach us? The power of life and death is right here in this tongue. Amen? So literally, this is why I think that communication is probably the most important thing in marriage because it literally is the thing that puts life back into your relationship. It's that powerful. To neglect it is to neglect the life-giving force of that relationship. When two people who live in the same house but never have meaningful conversation, you're roommates. You're not a marriage, okay? A marriage, and when there's communication, it is infusing that relationship back in life. Whenever I'm hearing about Missy's day, it's not that she's just telling me the facts of what happened at work. It's that she is experiencing. I'm experiencing her life with her, and it is in it is creating this environment of inclusion. Does that make sense? And so this is what you need. This is the whole point that we signed up for marriage is to do life together. Right? To do it together. Like, it is not good for man to be alone. Okay? But you can be married and be very much alone with the absence of com healthy communication. Okay. I'm assuming if your brow is like this and you're shaking your head forward, that means that's good. Okay, thank you, Lacey. All right, now, desire. So you have power in communication, the desire. How many of you desire to, A, be heard by your spouse and, B, to talk to your spouse? <laughs> Shh, don't be truthful. <laughs> in other words, if there's only one-sided communication, is that a healthy relationship? No. It's a two-way street. It is the fact that I want to, I want to share my life with her, but I need her to share my life, her life with me. It's a two-way street, okay? And so the desire, the way I can prove to you that desire is a part of communication is because when you first started dating, you desired very little other than to communicate with that other person. Correct? Matt and Tiffany's here um, because they get paid to be. But anyway, Matt uh, and Tiffany, when they started dating, it wasn't long after they started dating that she went back to work in London, England. That was expensive communication. And can you imagine Matt sitting there, this newfound love, okay, this woman of his dreams, and he's having to wait that it's not 3 o'clock in the morning because the different time, just waiting. He's like, I want to talk to her so bad, and I want to see her so bad, and I want to, right? You see what I'm saying? And so, and so there's that desire of communication, and, and if the desire's there in the beginning, shouldn't it not be there in the end? And like, is, is the sign of a mature marriage that we don't desire to communicate with one another? No. So that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the sign of a dead marriage, amen? But, but a healthy marriage is communication. Now, the danger of communication is in the same way that it has the absolute power to give life, it has the power to take life. How many of you have, A, experienced damage through communication in your marriage? Okay, thank you. How many of you have been the damager with communication in your marriage? And we, we all... When we talk about communication, we spend most of our time talking about how not to be a bad communicator, but we really don't harp on the fact of the power of communication that lit literally is probably the one greatest asset to your marriage, the ability to infuse life and create 
an environment of your marriage like hardly any other thing can. Amen? Okay? Um, Okay, good. Now, while we're on the subject of communication, there's this dude named Dr. Albert Maharabane or something like that. He's got a weird name. He's the author of a book called Silent Messages. And he is a guy who studies uh, uh, nonverbal communication. He found that, listen to this statistic, he found that 7% of any message is conveyed through words. 7% of what you're trying to say to your spouse is conveyed by words. Time out. This is why texting is a really poor form of really meaningful communication, not just with your spouse, but with humanity in general. Okay? Because 7% of what you're trying to say is actually getting across in the text message. Other, unless you're just caveman talk. I call caveman talk like, please bring more toilet paper. I don't need that to be meaningful. I just need you to bring me more toilet paper, right? Okay? Okay? That's a good text message. But trying to express the depth of my love and my desire for the other person through a text message, there's so much communication not happening. Amen? Okay, and you may be you may write a you may write a a, a this long of a of a text message, but there's very little actual communication happening. Correct? Okay, seven percent of any message is conveyed through words. Let's prove that point. Um, um, let's pretend. And I didn't want to speak that into the atmosphere, but we're going to anyway because it's fun. But let's pretend at the age of thirty-eight and thirty-seven, I come home. And Missy's got a, 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 what do you call those things, a birth control stick thing? Not a birth control, a birth testing thing. <laughs> she's got one of them. she got the danger stick in her hand, okay? And I walk in the door, and she's holding the stick. 38 years old, senior in high school, just about. And she says, shh. Listen, she says, we're going to use the same two words, same two words, every scenario. She's standing there, I'm pregnant. What did she say to me? A, she told me a fact. She's pregnant. It's a fact. She told me a fact. B, against all sound reason, she showed excitement. Correct? Correct? (laughs) Okay? She showed happiness. She showed joy. She created, in that moment, an atmosphere of positivity. I'm going to respond. I'm going to respond in like, you're pregnant. I walk in the door. She says, I'm pregnant. I walk in the door. You're pregnant. I respond with confusion. My world is spinning, right? I respond with not excitement. I'm, I'm upset. And then, and then even worse is, is five years ago, five years ago, I had a very successful visectomy. And now I walk in and go, you're pregnant? I have said the same thing. She said the same thing. We have conveyed myriads of different messages. Context matters. You understand? Context matters. This is why the one of the most crazy things in a marriage relationship is to is whenever you're discussing a subject and all of a sudden it gets flipped and you're talking about something else out of nowhere because and it's not in context anymore because you need to stay inside the context of where we started. Amen. <laughs> okay, that one didn't go over well either. Okay, but 38 is percent vocal elements. If I say, oh, <laughs> that says something, oh, right? Ah, ooh. <laughs> like, what's the, yeah, okay. okay. 55 is through nonverbal elements, facial expression, gesture, postures. Um, so if Missy comes in 
And Missy comes in, and I'm sitting in my chair, and I'm watching the Cubs play baseball, and she decides that's a good moment to try to tell me about something meaningful in her life, and she doesn't really care about what I'm doing. I'm supposed to just bow my life to what she's doing, and um, <clears throat> and she begins talking, and I'm listening, and I'm looking at the TV, and she says, what do you think about that? And I'm like, have I communicated? Absolutely I've communicated. What have I communicated? I could care less. Rizzo's up to bat. Amen? You see what I'm saying? So you say it best when you say nothing at all, right? Okay, there's some times when you can say nothing, and then they're like, I told you you was mad at me. I didn't even say anything, but you did say something. Right? You know what I'm talking about? So communication is the entire collaboration of your actual words, the context of what's going on, the, uh, the, the, the verbal cues, the nonverbal cues. Uh, it's all of it put together, okay? And so that's important for you to understand, okay? Because technically you can say the right thing, but you have communicated something extremely different, Okay? Now, I want to quickly talk about two extremes in communication. On one side, we have total openness in communication. Total openness. On the other side, we have zero openness. No openness. On one side, we discuss everything. We talk about everything. There's nothing off the table. Everything is talked about. Every feeling, everything ever gets talked about. It's unhealthy. The other side, nothing is talked about. Just do your, do it. Let's do what we do. Let's just walk through this life. Let's just, you know your job. I know my job. Let's just do it and let's not talk about it. Unhealthy. Okay? I'm going to say off the bat, this side is not good, correct? Total openness is not good. You probably shouldn't. I'm, I'm going to explain that in a little bit. At the other side, zero openness is the worst. It's more common and it's more damaging because. In the end, you 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 just you you drift off into ob- ob- obscurity, like you just die that way. Okay, I can deal with something if it was too much, but I can't deal with what never gets brought into the light. This is not good. You can create damage by being too open, amen. But at least I can deal with it. You probably need to learn a little bit of the fruit of the Spirit and self-control and understand some things, but I can at least deal with it over here. But if it never gets talked about and if it never comes to the light, then how am I ever going to deal with it? So this side over here is worse, and I find more of it in marital counseling. I find more people who are shut down and closed off and refuse to talk anymore than I find the jerk or whatever who just lets every little opinion that, that enters into his mind must come out of his mouth or hers. Okay? Amen? Now, Let's talk about total openness first. Proverbs chapter 10, 19. Mark, here's a scripture for you, okay? And we've all been here. We've all done this. Maybe not all of us, but most of us. People like me have done this. If you keep talking, it won't be long before you're saying something really wrong. How many of y'all are with me there? Okay? Prove your wise from the very start. Bide your tongue and be strong. If you keep talking, does that mean that if you talk at all? No. It means that into a 30-minute conversation, you made your point five minutes in. But you're still just hammering it in like a beating a dead horse over his head with 500 mallets until it's dead. Er. You just won't stop. And now you're telling me how yesterday's thing relates to mama's thing from 15 years ago and how that made you feel. And it's just like, hold up. I just, this thing right here, this what's one thing is what we're trying, right? Right? And it's like everything gets unleashed. I'm going to explain it to you this way. I was listening to, uh, how many know, but, uh, is it Family Matters? or who, 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 James Dobson, Family what? Huh? Focus on family or something like that. Anyway, James Dobson, Miss, and I'm not going to tell the story, but Missy and I was in Camden, living in Camden, and I'm not going to tell the story because it's, it's not appropriate for this, this room with kids and stuff. But we were, we were listening to the radio, and James Dobson had, gives a piece of advice. He says, it's absolutely unhealthy to share every secret of your heart in marriage. Let me prove it to you. Missy? No, that's just too weird. Okay. Um, <laughs> wife? Do you want to know every time your husband experiences lust? (laughs) 
trust me, you don't. Men are pigs. <laughs> that was supposed to be funny. <laughs> men are men. And they, there's a reason toothpaste spends millions of dollars to put naked women on a billboard. Half-naked women on a billboard. That's right. Right. And so, and so my point is, is that you don't want to know every thought that enters into the man's mind. You, women, husbands, do you want to know every time your wife has a negative feeling about you? No. Oh, no, I don't want to know. I, ignorance is bliss. Amen? Total ignorance is not bliss, but not every thought is a regenerated by heaven thought. Amen? And so total openness is not a good thing. This is like whenever you first start dating and, here's, and, 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 and you start learning each other. And, then, man, there's people in this church, right? You got past, right? You got past. Raise your hand if you had a past, okay? And let's say you're dating somebody for the first time and you start talking about your past. The next thing you know, you start talking about your past. The next thing you know, you realize this is getting pretty personal pretty quick, right? And then, and then there is this thing, do I want to know everything in their past? Is it necessary? Is it healthy for me to know everything? Let me help you. It's not. There are some things, some images that are going to come into your mind that you're going to have a hard time getting out because you had to know. That's good advice from a pastor. And I'm telling you, in the same way, you're going to go through life and you're going to go through marriage and not everything that you think and not everything you feel and not everything that you, that you experience needs to be communicated. Okay? When there's a lot of talking, and you just keep talking and keep expressing and keep expressing and keep expressing, a lot of times we, we, we miss our off-ramp. We find ourselves going 100 miles an hour down the interstate of conversation, and we've lost control of this vehicle. Okay? But far worse is the other side. And that is the side where we shut down and we don't talk. This is the side where we, and we're going to talk about more about this in, in a second, but this is a talk where, where through fear and other things we have learned it's not safe to talk, and we're going to just hold on, and we're going to bottle it up, and we're going to bottle it up, and we're going to bottle it up, and then one or two things are going to happen. We're either going to A, explode, or B, we're going to learn how to be the most coping, miserable person on the planet. And the bright, uh, shimmering, very attractive version of who you are, not attractive physically, but attractive in your personality and in your thoughts and in your desires and in your communication, that person gets shoved in the back of trying to hide all these emotions that they refuse to talk about. Does that make sense? And that's what destroys more marriages right there, okay? So uh, you have Ephesians chapter 4. 21. Let's start with verse 25. Okay? Let's start with verse 25. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Um, give me, actually, will you give me the New Living Translation, Mark? You're a good man. That is Mark, right? Okay, thank you. New Living Translation says this. Stop telling nope. 25. That's Chronicles, but I like, I like how you'd work there. Let's try Ephesians, Ephesians, Ephesians 4. Okay, stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbor, in this case our spouse, okay? Let us tell our spouse the truth. Don't hold anything back. Tell your neighbor the truth. Tell your spouse the truth, right? Y'all with me? Talk to one another. Tell them how you actually feel. Talk. Tell the truth. Amen? For we are our part of one body. This is the same. The body of Christ is the picture of marriage. The union between Christ and the church is the picture of marriage, right? We are, the two shall become. Talk to one another in truth. You're one. Amen? Okay? Let's go on to verse 26. Y'all have heard this scripture many times. Don't sin. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Is it possible to sin in the midst of anger? Raise your hand if you've done that. Is it possible to be angry and not sin? Yes. Raise your hand if you've done that. 
There's absolutely justifiable anger. Amen? Okay? Don't, let sin, don't sin by letting anger control you. It's whenever you lose control of anger and it controls you rather than controlling it. Don't let, how many of you used this against your spouse at some point? I have on Missy several, several times. Don't let the sun go down while you're angry. We're going to talk about that. And we'll be, it'll be five o'clock and it'll be five o'clock in the morning. And we've had up all night fighting like we do, like last Saturday night. And we're just fighting and fighting. That's a joke, by the way. But, you know, and it's like, and she's like, I don't want to go to bed. I don't want to talk about this anymore. And I'm like, the Bible said, don't let the sun go down on our anger. The sun went down a long time ago. We're going to catch it before it comes back up. Okay? Right? Because I want to get it done. Okay? Don't let sun, don't let sun go down while you're still angry. Verse 27, for anger gives foothold to the devil. Praise God. Verse 25, one more time. I want to read it one more time real quickly. Don't t- Stop telling lies. Let us tell our wives, our husbands, our spouses, our neighbors the truth, for we are all part of the same body. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Anger gives a foothold. The concept there of don't let the sun go down your anger is not necessarily the time frame of the sun. It's that don't you just sit back and not deal with, your, with, with the emotion going on inside of you. You've got to talk, Right? You've got to speak. doesn't matter that it's a 12-hour frame of window. That's not what we're talking about. It's that don't let the sun go down and leave. Un- don't leave unresolved issues in your life. You've got to communicate with that person. Okay? Now, jump back up to verse 23, 21. 21. This is both of the scenarios. Since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, verse 22, Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Amen? Indeed, let the Spirit renew your thought and your attitude. Let the Spirit renew your thought and your attitude. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly, truly righteous and truly holy. Stop Verse 25, thank you, Mark. Stop telling lies. Let us tell each other the truth. So before you get to a point of communication, this is not a seminar of marriage to the unbeliever. This is to the believer. I don't know how to counsel people who are not believers in marriage. I only have what the Word of God teaches. Amen? For us believers, ideally in the perfect world, what we need to do before we ever enter into communication is go and make sure we're putting off our old self and bringing every thought and attitude subject to Christ and then go into a communication situation with our spouse. Ideally, in a perfect world, that's what we should do. Not just with your husband and your wife, but with for people in general. Amen? But that's very often not how it happens, is it? You get home, something's not done the way you thought it should have been done. You, you, you said something uh, smart ugly to the other person, and all of a sudden, whoosh, right? And Missy has for years said, Chester, I need to stop talking. I need to go and get my thoughts together. I need to go and think before I say something really stupid. And then Chester, being the man of God, he's like, that's what the Bible says. Don't let the sun go down, no anger. We got to talk about this. I'm, I, I want to just, rawr. and then listen, and then, I, and then I'm telling you about 20 minutes of a good fight, and then I'm done, and I'm like, I'm over it. And she's pretending to be over it. Amen. Because it's my way or that. Anyway, so the point is, if she can go and calm down, and if she can go and get her attitude in check then she's going to come back and she's going to say what she really thinks and probably omit some of the things that she just wants to say in anger, which is don't sin in anger, right? How many of you in anger have said something to your spouse you did not mean and you knew you was a jerk when you said it? Yes. I I said it to be a jerk, right? It was the point. I'm mad. I could give a flying flatulence in space, how I make you feel right now. I just want to get it off my chest. Right? Don't pretend like you've never done that. Some of you, I don't think you might actually ever have, but I've done that. Okay? But Missy's wisdom says, Missy's wisdom says, we're going to wait. But here's where Missy, the Missy in the scenario gets in trouble. Is Missy's excuse to wait can often turn into an excuse to never deal with it. Right? 
Now, let me just say this. It was probably Chester's overreaction to the last conversation we had is the fear she has of actually dealing with it. So she doesn't want to deal with it because she knew the last time I tried opening up, he made me feel about this big, and he told me how the, the cow eats the corn, or how does that go? He told me all that, and yeah, cabbage, some, how the cabbage eats the corn, right? And so, and so my point is, is I, have, I have instilled in her a fear of communicating because of my previous action. By the way, this is all hypothetical. So anyway, and so I haven't seen her fear of communicating because of my previous action. And so in, in what looks like wisdom to wait, she's really just hoping. Look at me. When it looks like wisdom to wait, she's really just hoping she can get out of this current moment and, and it'll just kind of float away. And then what happens is, is that moment turns into another moment that turns into another moment. And before you know it, it's years later and she's never really got things off her chest and it's, and it's, and it's causing her anxiety. It's causing her depression. You think I'm being funny? I'm not. Like, and she's just bottling, bottling, bottling. And she's either A, going to explode one day and just, I'll, I'll wake up to a John, John Deere, not John, that's a tractor, Dear John letter or something like that. And, or John Deere, <laughs> I bought you a tractor. <laughs> and or, and or, and or the woman whom I fell in love with, who was, who, who was strong, who had ideas, who had a personality, she is so dumbed down by the repression of her emotions that she's not even the same person that I knew. Okay? Are y'all with me? Is this good stuff? No. John Gottman, a professor of psychology at the University of Washington, identified four predicators of divorce in couples. One of them is contempt. What is contempt? It is a deep, long-term anger. It is a bitter, negative, hopeless kind of resentment that can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Resentment does not occur instantaneously, but instead it is a result of a long buildup of frustration, of putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. Frustration of disappointment and conflict. We all get upset sometimes. That's natural in any relationship. We need to guard against our marriages is letting the short-term anger marinate into contempt. How do I how do I combat short-term anger turning into a long-term contempt? Tell let us tell our neighbors the truth. It is a heartfelt, true, and honest communication that hopefully has been filtered by the Spirit and our attitudes and our words are, and our thoughts are in check. Amen? Christians really should be the best communicators on the planet. Are you with me? We really should be. We have access to the most pure form of filtering our thoughts and emotions out there. We better take advantage of it. Amen? Okay, good. The book, uh, the book about uh, love, marriage, boat. What, what's, 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 what's it called? I can't remember. The book with the big, the book I told you all to buy. Okay, why people hide their feelings. Number one, they learn that sharing is not safe. Now, I, a while ago I said sharing is not safe because I created it not safe. Sometimes you enter into a relationship with somebody and marriage somebody and their past relationship taught them that sharing was not safe. And so you just happen to find out after the fact. Okay? That's why a dating relationship that's healthy and has lots of counsel and takes some time is probably wise. Amen. All the dads said. Okay? They learn that sharing is not safe. They have old fears that keep them from sharing. They don't. Sometimes people just don't have the skills of communication. I grew up in a home where my mom and dad talked about stuff. They did it with respect. They did it with honor. They'd go into the bedroom, shut the door. They would, they would hash it out, come back out as a united front. They dealt with stuff. Maybe you grew up in a home where that wasn't the case. Maybe you grew up in a home where it was very unhealthy communication, and, 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 and you decided, I'm never going to be like that. And so you tried to safeguard yourself from being what you don't want to be, but you, you swing the pendulum so far to the other side. So the person over here was a raging lunatic, and you just try to be a, a shut-up individual. And you just don't possess. You've never witnessed and never understood healthy communication. Does that make sense? Okay? So sometimes you just don't know. That's why going to classes, like, look at me, that's why going to marriage seminars and marriage classes and, and sitting down with, with maintenance on your marriage is a good idea. Amen? 
If you just wait until you have a problem to do something about your marriage, it's, it's about as smart as changing the oil whenever your motor blows up in your car. Okay. Uh, experiences. Now, here's, here's something that I've dealt with. Um, you sit down and, and somebody, a couple goes through something so traumatic that literally they don't know how to talk about it. My grandmother was this way. Growing up, I can think of one or two, uh, two times she would talk about a particular subject. And when she would do it, she would black out, go there, and then she would catch herself, wake up, and she'd stop talking, and it was no more. She, she literally had one of her sons die in, in her arms in a freak accident in her home that they still live in today. Did that event have ramifications on their marriage? Could she talk about it? You see what I'm saying? She literally spent two years psychologically not healthy. Okay. Understandably, right? Okay? She just couldn't. She couldn't. Even in her old age, she would be 90 on her birthday at the, end of the, at the end of the month. And today, you can try to talk to her about it, and she just, she, she you know, her eyes glass over. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? And so, what do you do? Am I going to force you? You know what I'm saying? And so, so there's, there's a rare set of circumstances that sometimes it's just so painful people just can't talk. Okay? And uh, they feel, here's something that we deal with. People, this is why we don't talk. We hide our feelings. Is they feel that things that they want to share are completely unacceptable. Have you ever done something in the midst of your marriage that was so full of shame you didn't want to talk about it? Right? Especially with the one person whom you probably hurt in that situation. Right? It could be anything. It could be, and I'm not, I'm not even going to speculate, it just could be anything. And so they, they, they feel like, I can't discuss this thing. It, it can't be, you know, they, they might know about it. They might not know about it. But either way, I don't want to talk about it, okay? Okay, so you have to deal with that. And you have to understand, okay, let's say that, let's say you're a spouse of somebody who did something that's not cool. And you're in a position to absolutely forgive and to move on and to heal. But they're in a position that they can't look you hardly in the eye right now. You know what I'm talking about? And so what are you going to do? Are you going to force them into come communication before they're ready? Or are you going to love them through grace to give them time to come? by the Because by the, you're going to pray in the Holy Ghost and all that kind of stuff we believe in, right? You're going to pray to get them to a point where they can talk. Okay? All right. Are we there? They think that their desires or wants are not important. That's one of the reasons they don't talk. If you've ever been led to believe that what you feel is not, uh, is not important, then that's a mistake. Let me just say this, though. That's a mistake. I, okay, do I think that everything you feel is, um, should be, what's the word I'm going to look, I'm going to use here, um, encouraged? I ordered today a book, I'd given it away two or three times. I ordered today a book um, called Love Must Be Tough. James Dobson. If you've not read that book, read it. He describes a scenario in the book where a, a wife of a husband, husband was done with the wife, totally, totally done, checked out. And in order for him, uh, okay, in order for him to, to try to manipulate the situation, he began to suggest ways to keep their marriage healthy by, let's say, opening up the marriage. And opening up the chamber, you know what I'm saying? And so, and so he's saying, well, I feel like, he's saying, I feel like if we had more uh, spice in our life, our marriage would be better. Does he feel that way? Absolutely, he feels that way. Absolutely, he feels that way. He believes in his deception. That's absolutely true. He feels that way. Do you want to encourage that feeling? Do you want to validate that feeling? No. James Dobson's like, punch that feeling right up in the face. Say no. Put your foot down. Set a boundary. Amen? Okay? That's the extreme. I think that very rarely can you just look at your partner and say, 
you're wrong. That's a lie. Don't feel that way, right? Very rarely. But there are just some scenarios out there where it's like, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not playing ball with you on that. I can maybe understand how you would get there, but I'm not, agree- I'm not coming into any type of agreement with that unregenerated, unfiltered attitude and emotion from hell. Not coming into agreement with it. With it. Amen? Okay? Okay? Not every emotion you feel should be validated in your life. Amen? But we should seek to understand the other person in all situations. Why are they feeling that way? Why would you come to that conclusion? What am I doing that makes you want to go look somewhere else, right? Help me understand this. I'm not coming into agreement with that. That's from H-E double hockey sticks and we're going to send it right back or you there one, (laughs) but right? But but I I need to understand what's going on here, okay? There's a difference between yeah, I could, you know, I understand. I understand you. That's it's PG, not cool. Okay, I understand you. And there's a difference of what this woman does because she will not set a boundary. Is well, let me think about that. Let me. Why does a why does a a a, a lady? who's married to a man who punches her in the face repeatedly over the years, continue to live with her. Does he have actual emotions? Should we validate that? You see what I'm saying? But there's something in her. There's fear. There's, there, there's something in her, that, that the codependency there, that she would not. Anyway, you all with me? You all understand what I'm saying by that? Okay. How to fix this stuff. Stop lying. Stop lying. This is actually from the book, not me. Number one, we outright lie. I don't understand how, how lying in any marriage is acceptable. If Missy, if I find Missy lying to me, literally about anything, it takes trust away. Lying is an extremely damaging uh, component to a relationship. But lying is communication. Lying is saying, I care more about me than I care about you. That makes sense? Lying communicates all kinds of things. And so lying is never acceptable. And, it's, and, and I tell you, I have sat down in a myriad of counseling, and lying is generally always there. Amen? Stop lying. Number two, stop fudging, which is just sort of lying. <laughs> How many of y'all don't lie? Oh, God, it's in revival. How many of y'all don't lie? Okay, thank you. How many of you have fudge every once in a while? <laughs> okay, good. Don't even gray lie. Tell the truth. Be direct. Don't be a jerk, but don't be vague. Vague oftentimes comes across as passive-aggressive. Well, how did that make you feel? Well, you know, I just, you know, I just, I feel, ew, when you, ew, when you, when that happened, I just, I just, I feel dirty and ew, right? And, and ew. What? How did that make you feel? How about saying, whenever you said that to me, it made me angry. I wanted to punch you in the face. How do, why do you think you can disrespect me and talk to me that way? Tell, say what you mean. You trying to sugarcoat the situation is just perpetually pushing it off and pushing it off and pushing it off. Say what you mean. You ain't got to be a jerk. Amen. Speak the truth in. But the truth is the truth at the end of the day. So if someone, if, you, if, if Missy comes to me and, and, she's, and she says something extremely disrespectful, you know, and, and, and which has never happened. I don't think it really has. Anyway, she says something very disrespectful, and then and, and I just look at her and say, and, and, and she's like, and then you know, 20 minutes later, she's like, well, "What's wrong with you? N- nothing. What do you mean nothing? Well, you know, you you was being rude. 
No, why don't I just stop and say, okay, this is what's wrong with me. When you walked in the door and you was upset about something that happened at work and Bethany made you mad because she's a punk, okay? Okay, when you walked in, sorry, Bethany. <laughs> and so, and she walked in and then you was mad at him and then you saw me and you saw that I had not picked up my flip-flops like you asked me to and you just went off like you went cuckoo, your eyes crossed, your, your hair rolled back in your head. Okay, and you just, I mean, you, and like you're going crazy. That's not okay. You can't do that. That's not okay. That's not okay. Right? I'm direct. I'm straightforward. And then I need to stop talking. Because if I don't stop talking, here's what happens. That's not okay. And by the way, last week you did it too. And you did it to Chad. And you did it to Lexi. And you did it to Hannah. You do it to everybody. You be walking down to freaking Walmart and you're just cussing people out. What's wrong with you? Right? Now, how many of y'all have done that before? Okay? You go and you stop once you've made your point. Right? But then we want to turn it into World War 17. Okay. Face the fear. Some of you need some courage in your communication in your marriage. Face the fear. Man up and tell her what's wrong with you. Woman up and tell him what's wrong with you. If you refuse to address something because you're afraid she's going to leave again, that is not marriage. That's a hostage situation. I'm going to get a lot of men who are going to help me on this one, I think, and probably some women too. Say more with less. This is in the book. This was not my idea. This was in the book. Say more with less. The book actually teaches us to say all what you need to say with a third of the total words you would have used. It forces you to be direct. It brings up the point of communication. The point of what we're trying to get across got lost about, about 10 minutes into the rant. Right? I mean, you're just, your mind is spinning. You're, you're, I mean, you're just, you've you got a dazed look in your face, and it, it's coming through your head. It's just <laughs> right out your mouth like a slippery ski slope. And it's just, <laughs> I'm thinking it, I'm saying it, I'm thinking it, I'm saying it. Okay, what, what, what were we talking about again? Missy's my, Missy and I's very first uh, marital fight was over a mushroom. It's a great, it's a great story. I'm not going to take time to tell it. But in the midst of that fight, tons of other junk started coming out. If, if we would have just said the point about the mushroom, apologized about the mushroom, and just stopped, we'd have been fine. But it had been one of the most mem- memorable fights we've ever had over a mushroom. <laughs> okay? So stop talking. Bring up the point to communicate. Number one, to actually communicate the thought or desire. And to two, or two, how many of you know there's times you need to get something off your chest? Right? That's okay as long as you do it sanctified. Say what's on your mind. Get it off your chest. Stop. And then, and then, and then, and then don't be shocked when the other person isn't just like, oh, yeah, I completely understand. I know I've been a punk. I should not have do that. Okay? And, and, and just don't be shocked. Allow them to have their response. You've got to get it off your chest. Then don't get mad because they decided when it's my turn. Amen? Okay? So, okay, and so here's the thing is we want to get we want to we want to unload and then just go, okay, we're done. Stop, no, no more. We're done. That's not communication, that's that's dictating. Right? So allow them, this is in the book as well, say what you need to say and allow them to have their response and you be quiet and listen. Actually, actually listen. Actually, no, 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 stop, no, no, stop, stop. You're thinking about what you want to say. Stop and listen. How many of you are good listeners? Raise your hand. How many of you are terrible listeners? I cannot remember anybody's name because I'm thinking Chester Ed Passmore the third. What's your name? Chester Ed Passmore. Am I saying the third or just give it the no, Chester the third? I'm analyzing how I'm going to say my name. How many of y'all don't know what I'm talking about? Okay. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very bad listener, okay? But actually sitting down and shutting up, I am the world's worst about cutting people off. I cut myself off, okay? I, 
I'm the world's worst about cutting people off. If I can keep my mouth shut and listen to you talk and actually not, and try to just mind-numbingly not think about anything that I think and just listen, what is she saying? What is she trying to say, even if she's not doing a good job? What are you saying? Let's talk. And if I can hear her, I could probably go, mm-hmm. Missy, now, Missy does this. Missy, and, and you need to figure out if this works for you, okay? And you need to find the balance of this. Missy hates a heated discussion with me because I'm a very good arguer, right? Missy is not. She's terrible at it, okay? She's very, 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 very bad at it, okay? The, and, and, and so what she wants to do is she wants to write it all out. How many of y'all do this? She wants to write it all out. She wants to think about it, pray over it, look at it. She wants to cross things out and write it again. And then she wants to present that to me. And then we want to have a conversation, okay? That's what she wants to do. And it works better if we do that. Because if I don't let Missy do that, the bomb, the ticking bomb, it goes off. And then she turned, like literally one time we was in a fight and she picked up my backpack. I'd just been on a mission trip. I had my Walkman, all kinds of stuff. She picked it up, slammed it up against the wall. And then the beauty had turned into the beast. Can y'all see her doing that? It's scary. Okay. Okay. And I'm not going to talk about anything I've ever done because it's not real. Okay. So, but the point is, the point is that if I don't let her process her thoughts, then she you know what I'm talking about? I mean, you any, any of y'all like that? Okay. So uh, let your mate have their own reaction. Address the reason why you can't talk. If, if there's something you're going through and you just can't talk about it right now, at least have the courtesy to tell the other person, I, I can't talk about this. And, I, and it's not you. It's me right now. And it's, it's so painful. It's hard. But you need to give me some time to process this. Okay. And then if you hear that from them, you need to be okay with that. And then mark a date in your calendar to come back to it. Okay. But forcing conversation is probably not going to end well. Ask me how I know. Listen, really listen. Don't use distancing language. We say some of the dumbest stuff when we're in a heated conversation. Okay, uh, Missy comes in here, and she sees, go, go back to me sitting in the recliner, and, and there's my flip-flops on the floor. I didn't put them up. She comes in, why didn't you put up your flip-flops? And then the next phrase out of her mouth is what? You never... Ever, you always, I've told you this a million times. I, I picked them up yesterday. You didn't say a word about it yesterday. I had the kids pick them up the day before that. <laughs> right? But we take, a, we take an instance and we turn it into a habitual pattern. And sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. And but what we use, we grand decide, grand de, grand de, we make everything bigger than it is. That makes sense? You always say that. You, you've never liked my mom. You're right. Okay, now listen. Okay, so, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm sorry. Are you, I really am kidding. Are you saying, okay, are you saying what you really mean? Do you ask yourself this question in the, midst of a, in the midst of a community. Are you saying what you really mean? Or are you just saying what you feel? Because what you feel and what you mean aren't always the same thing. And, and, what you, and, and, and what you want to communicate and what you're saying isn't always the same thing. Who is talking, the true you or the angry you? Okay. Have a clear understanding of what you're trying to accomplish in the communication before you start. It is not a good idea to step into the MMA ring and just get it. It's not a good idea. Have a goal in mind. We have this issue. I would like to resolve this single issue. I'm not trying to save the entire world. I just want to fix this one thing in this moment. But if you don't set some parameters in that communication, you're going to go through everything. And guess what? You're going to get nothing done. But if we can just discuss this one issue and stay on topic and keep our sanity and, and not just go act like crazy people and, I don't know, be like adults and Christians at the same time, who knows what could happen? Amen? Great. I don't like this. Um. Missy will say some, I don't know why I wrote this down. Uh, don't deal in the abstract and vague. Missy will say sometimes, I don't even know why I'm mad at you right now, but I am mad at you. 
Is that true? She, she will just get, and I don't ever do I'm perfect. Okay, but she was just like, I don't even know why I'm mad at you. And I'm like, I don't either, but you are. Like, you, you like, right? How many of you ever done that? Like, you started off, and the next thing you know, I'm like, I don't even know why I'm, I've gone to 10, right? There's yarning going on. Chris is yarning. Everybody's yarning. Hey, James 3, I'm going to read it real fast. We can make large, a large horse go wherever he want by the means of a small bit in its mouth. A small rudder uh, makes a huge ship turn wherever the, the pilot chooses to go. Even the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is small is a small thing that makes grand speeches. A tiny spark can set a great forest fire, right? Among all the parts of the body, the tongue is the flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting the entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. You can go to the circus and you can watch them tear, uh, take a lion or a tiger and walk it around on a leash, and, but yet... No one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses. Literally, I'm the preacher, and I might be in here preaching you the gospel, and Missy may be at home thinking, how is that word coming out of your mouth? Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. What is James saying right there? Is you forgot who you're talking to. You see them as the problem. You see them as the, as the evil person. You forgot you're talking to a son or daughter of the living God. When did we stop becoming, when did we stop being Christian in the midst of this? So blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out of both fresh water and bitter waters? Does a fig tree produce olives, grapevine produce figs? No, you can only draw fresh water from a, you cannot draw fresh water from a salty spring. And that brings me to my last point. The tongue is unruly, the Bible teaches us, right? The greatest component to healthy communication, in my opinion, is the ability to forgive each other for what we say. Forgiveness. All of us at any point, at some point in our marriage is going to say something dumb. Amen? Does that justify the saying of the dumb? No. But he just got through saying the tongue is completely unruly. It can set a forest on fire with this speech. Amen? Some days I do well with my tongue. Some days I don't. That's not an excuse. That's not an excuse to just let it fly. Amen? Don't do that. At the same time, I cannot make her any promises that I will never again hurt her with my speech. Correct? Can you make that promise to your spouse? So therefore, therefore, the most necessary component to your communication in your future is forgiveness. Well, I always hold what you say to me against you, or I, can I actually let something go? Amen? Amen?